mathematical way to infer data. Yeah, it could be mathematical, yeah. Could be simple counts too, yeah, good. All right, so I actually have a definition I borrowed from uh, you know, Charlie over at MPSU. And so I'm gonna repeat it here. So hopefully everyone here will, will agree with this. <laughs> so my definition is to answer business questions through data. Right? And of course, this is a very broad term. It means quite a bit. But I just want to make sure that we're all level set here to say we're answering business questions because ultimately at the end of the day, there are a lot of research questions we can answer, but that doesn't pay the bill for data science. And if anyone disagrees, like I always say, you can leave now. So. <laughs> okay. So moving on, this is good. We got a good, good report here. Next question, what is machine learning? You can see we're building up to it. I'm giving some hints on the side, so. Who wants to venture a guess what is machine learning? What, what does machine learning mean to you, I should say? There's no right or wrong answer. Finding signal and data to get some uh, order confidence. Finding signal and data, so that could be, could be, sounds like signal processing, but it could be, yeah. Anything else? Yes. So basically you're just doing, using software to get your business questions together? Using software, uh, definitely could use software. Could maybe do other things, actually, but yeah. Answering business questions, continuing. But what's so special about machine learning? What differentiates from data science? Yes, in the back. Uh, using machine learning is kind of uh, software that helps machines to find information that they need to learn What a great answer. We are done. We can all go home now. So. <laughs> and she is exactly right. So my definition. Again, this is purely biased. So it's the ability to improve performance without explicit instruction, right? And that's machine learning, a variety of tasks. I'm trying to be as broad as possible. So if everyone, you know, the next person comes up to you and say, what is machine learning? You are all set, so. So you can see where we're building up to, right? Because the next question, I put it, a hint on the page to tell you what, whatever. So the question is, what is AI? So who wants to take that? Okay, here we go, brave man there. I'd actually say we're just building a process around machine learning to let it be embedded in the business so we're just growing the business. All right, the answer is to put a process around machine learning to allow you to embed it in your corporation. Very good. Um, who else? Definitely an application of AI, I agree. Yes? Okay, I think uh, she's, I repeat, the answer is, uh, it not only learns by itself, but it learns to collect data, it learns to learn, I think that's what you were trying to say, so. Yeah, yes. Answering business questions using data to improve performance without explicit instruction. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were that kid that got that 4.0, I could tell, so. <laughs> no, this is very good, yes, so in fact, uh, I do wish that people mentioned the word business with AI, because I think that's one of the things I'm gonna hit, one of the main points. Right now, people talk about AI, and uh, they imagine Hollywood. And you know, for us in this conference, we're not interested in you know, killer robots, right? We're interested in how to improve business value with AI. And so my definition, again, right now there's literally 2,000 definitions out there, but my definition is very simple. It's the ability of a machine to replicate intelligent human behavior. So again, broad enough to cover the robot, cover the business case, cover the learning to learn. But we humans are very interesting. We have this unique ability to not just learn to learn, we have the ability to learn in different ways. And we can talk about that at the very end. Yeah. <clears throat> Little brief facts on AI. Uh, these are facts, data that I've uh, obtained from IDC. <clears throat> the amount of uh, money being spent in corporate, for AI, and call it AI, ML, call it uh, you know, data science is in there, is astronomical. $19.1 billion this past year. And very quickly, growing by leaps and bounds, you know, expected to grow to $52.2 billion in 2021, which is why I quit and start my company, now everyone knows, so, yeah, <laughs> right? 40% of companies are already engaging or looking at digital transformation services. Now, those are very fancy terms, right? And the question that 
comes up constantly at this conference is, well, how do we do that? Like, do we just go and hire a data science team? Do we go and like, you know, grab a PhD or a scientist or a professor from a, a local university? You know, these are tough questions. If, we're, if we mean to actually stay competitive in this world, we have to figure this out, and we have to figure it out fast. So really quick, I tend to segment corporations into at least three tiers about how they adopt, uh, call it AI, call it ML. So we're all familiar with the very top, the, uh, the AI native, call it, um, you know, corporations, the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, right? Second tier are people, and a lot of you actually work there, or actually are, you know, senior folks there, you know, are people looking at adopting AI and AI ML, right? If you recognize the need that we have to do this, we don't know how, but and maybe we know how, we're trying different ways, but we have to do it because that's the only way to stay competitive. Right, and the last ones are the Sears and Kmart's, I shouldn't say that, so. Uh, the people that are where? I didn't mention any companies here in town, so, yeah. Uh, and, and they're coming along. They're gonna have to do something. They're just, rather than being first, they rather observe and see what can happen. Yeah. So really, I have three big ideas that I wanna actually try to convey to you during this talk. And I'm gonna go through each one. And uh, please, if you disagree, Feel free to chime in, right? So I, this is a two-way conversation. All right, the very first, and I love this Dilbert one. So a lot of people focus on getting AI to get AI. And my biggest criticism is that no, it should be absolutely tied to business value, right? So all of you here, uh, whether you're in the technology side and the data science side or whatever, you have to consider business value in the projects that you do. Now, you know, I came from a firm that did a lot of very interesting NLP on stuff that was very interesting, but there was always a constant push to say, before we actually even undergo the first line of code, does this have business value to us or to our clients? If we didn't do that, we would actually burn up all our resources. Uh, we did that anyway, but we would at least have a... <laughs> Have achieved something at the end of the day, other than just having a great Christmas party, so. Yeah, this uh, Dilbert thing just came out, so it's pretty cool. Like, why do analytics, oh, hey, good question. Quiz time again. Why do you think analytics projects fail? And for people who just caught the glimpse, <laughs> yes, right there. Bad definition of analytics. Bad definition of analytics, good, yeah. The expected time of payoff was shorter, did you say? Oh, all right, so the opposite, yeah, so, yes. So project timelines extending beyond infinity, yes. Uh, yes? People are asking the right questions. People asking the right question. They aren't asking the right questions, right? Yeah, so. Bad data, very good, right? Data should be in there, right? So there's a number of reasons why analytics projects fail. Okay, yes. Yeah, I don't have to give this talk. You guys can take my place. This is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My experience has been it's really hard to get folks to engage with the data and understand the things that they're finding. Yeah, like metrics and success criteria. What are those? Yeah, so. So I've listed the top few that I've experienced, and a number of you have probably experienced yeah, in your careers, right? Lack of business, lack of focus on the actual business question and ROI, right? It could like maybe make the company you know ten million dollars, but it costs fifteen million to actually do. A really bad idea at the end. Uh, failing to find metrics and success criteria. Like the standard uh, question always comes up is how good is this model? Well, how good was it? What did we define good to be? Right? Good as in performance, running fast, being able to scale. Good as in you know, you know I hate to use the term you know ROC curve, area under the curve to be X. Like no one understands that. And so it takes some very explicit you know, front-end work to, to define your success criteria, to make sure you can communicate it to the uh, stakeholders so everyone's on the same page before you undertake this. Yeah, and it's just saving you guys a lot of trouble because, I mean, you don't want to spend six to nine months at the end of the time and people are disappointed. And it's like, yeah, but what the heck is so? Uh, data strategy. So I want to mention bad data. Bad data, missing data, lack of access to data. 
we had a client that had tons of data, but you could, it was so siloed you couldn't get to it, right? And so it took us two and a half years to get to it. And to the point back there, by that point, is the insight even worth any value at that point, so, right? And, and the very last one is very important, and I'll define what ERPQ is. Um, I actually learned this from my old CEO, but who knows what ERPQ is? Take a wild guess. This comes up later. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Not it, but that sounds great. So. <laughs> All right, we'll get to it. All right. Do's and don'ts, right? Just a co very common. Like, don't be a, a, a you know, fear out. Don't say, I have to get this because, you know, my competitor across the street or across town is doing it, right? Do ask, how can I actually improve the bottom line or top line? Very important questions, right? And not just for you, but for every stakeholder involved in the project needs to be asking these questions up front, okay? Uh, analytics maturity model, who's actually familiar with this? This has come up quite a bit. We've seen this before, yes, right? So it's come up a lot now because again, uh, senior stakeholders, you know, the C-suite, they're considering this now. It's actually migrated to them. The consultants have gotten in front of them long enough that they actually realize that this is important. And so people are considering this, which is good. But again, considering this in the absence of business value is bad. So you don't need to move up the ladder if it doesn't help accrete business value, right? The standard, uh, one of the things as a data scientist you would quickly realize, like, the definition of, my definition of data scientist is a person that can really take, like, can take shortcuts really nicely, so, right? If lexicons work, if like, something simple works, if Excel works, like, and it works well, does it make sense to invest in all the data science effort and the production and productization of that model? No, so just realize that. Uh, any questions? You could see I'm stalling, yeah, so. <laughs> so, very quickly, just a quick summary of that page. This is what I define in terms of descriptive and prescriptive. I don't actually want to go four tier. I think it's very simple to say, you're either on the left side or you're moving to the right side, right? And that movement really depends on how can you extract business value by moving to the right side. Yeah, so all the slides are available afterwards, so, so as, as well as recording, so you guys can critique my jokes, so. Big idea, right? Business value is only unlocked and achieved when you actually put those models in production. So how many here are people who are data scientists? Just raise your hand. Ah, quite a bit, good. How many of you have deployed a model in production? Okay, how many of those models have stayed in production? Yeah, so good, good, yeah. So you guys got paid, so that's good. So you guys are buying, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's very important to have a model employed in production. One of the things about my previous you know, job was actually managing a team of 15 data scientists. And getting a model in production was like the number one goal. Right? You don't unlock that business value, you don't get it in production. So what does that mean? And we talked earlier today about people, you know, people in first instance getting an 85% in accuracy in their model, and then you spent six months to raise the 89%. Well, that doesn't happen actually, right? So, so you shouldn't be doing that. You gotta really focus on getting stuff in production. But the important thing is, Getting a model in production is not easy, especially at scale. So if you work for a large corporate and your model applies to sort of corporate-wide data, getting at the scale is extremely difficult. And let's talk a little bit about that, right? Especially if you're working on deep learning models and more of a leading edge, you will find this scenario coming up quite a bit in conversation, right? Developed a great model. It can actually read your mind, right? The only problem is you can't deploy it. You can't deploy it beyond one model. And if you have, let's say, corporate data at a scale of corporate transactions, whatever, say 10 million a day, how are you gonna deploy any deep learning model to process 10 million a day transactions a day? So despite all the innovation going on in deep learning, getting some of that to scale is <laughs> extremely difficult, unless you're a AI native corporation like you know, Amazon and Google. But luckily, things are actually improving, and I'll talk about different tools and frameworks that potentially you guys may have exposure to. Uh, how many people have actually built a deep learning model and got into production? Nobody, yes, yep. So I'm just saying, 
for the data scientists out there, all those times and effort you spent like learning about deep learning, it's like, uh, it's, uh, it's like hula hoops, so. Okay, ERPQ. This is something, again, very important that we emphasize uh, at my previous company, uh, and I think we should all emphasize. It's enterprise-ready production quality, right? Deploying code, deploying models, unless it satisfies you know, this criteria, it should not go in production. And you've not unlocked business value, right? And what does this mean? This means a number of things. It doesn't mean I build a model, I got it to run, I'm, I'm golden, right? Because there's a whole host of auditing, uh, versioning, you know, reproducibility, security, and we'll talk all about that, so. So, since half of us are data scientists, we are familiar with the data science cycle, right? I left that one step in here, which was play ping pong and drink beer, so. <laughs> um, yeah, but this is the data science cycle for people who are not familiar, right? It's getting some data, building a model, iterating, figuring out it's good enough, put it in deployment. Once you deploy it, it's to make sure you monitor it because model drift is something that people should be very cognizant of. Especially if you put a model over, you know, in production over long term, you can guarantee there will be model drift. Ah, okay, who, who actually model, who monitors model drift? Let's get this question here. Three, barely. I guess I have a half raised hand, okay, all right. So some of the ERPQ challenges, right? So data scientists know you may use a notebook, you may use an IDE, you're writing some code, you're training some model, and then after that model's deployed, you say, great, I'm gonna stick it somewhere. Copy it on S3, put it in GitHub, and say, here you go, here's my model. But there's a whole host of issues with that, right? Especially if your client, and typically, if you're working with a large client, will have this newly formed, what I call, um, they're like the stormtroopers in Star Wars. They're called the model validation team. And their role is to try to poke holes as best as they can. And so we've been through a lot of wars with model validation teams. I've got the scars, I can show you. But it's something that's actually uh, more and more, I guess, uh, it's being, uh, how's it put this way? It's actually being embraced by industry. And so for you, if you're not familiar with model validation teams, you should be because they're coming your way. And this is part of the increased regulatory process. People are starting to say, yes, we gotta get in front of this, and we have to make sure that we can you know, explain the models, we can understand them, we can re reproduce them, very importantly. Reproducing a model is actually extremely difficult, as you know. Let's say you gather the data, you have a database, and you query the data for a set of training data. You train your model and deploy it, great. Someone adds a new sample in that database. Well, your query is different now. You can't reproduce it, right? And, and the other thing is like, uh, as you know, if you're familiar with scikit-learn and you use the Python sort of ecosystem, you know how many versions of scikit-learn and NumPy are there? And you know how different some of those co that code is? So just saving like your random seeds is not good enough. And so, yeah, anyway. So we focus on the data, we focus on the model, and we focus on the node and code that actually generates that model, right? And I've pretty much left out documentation. That's someone else's job, so. <laughs> Right, so there's been a number of tools that have been open source tools that have been uh, in pro and projects that are out there that allow you to do model versioning. And I hope that you guys are somewhat familiar with this. And if not, you know, the takeaway from this talk is to actually go and look at some of these, right? So who here is familiar with DVC? A few, good. You wanna talk about it? It's Git for data. It's Git for data, and that's a lot of paradigms for a lot of these. So why is Git for data important? Right, so to repeat that, it's, uh, it's good for data. It's important because you can version your data just like you can version your code. Yeah, so it's actually a very powerful framework. It's one of the early ones, one of the easier ones to use, believe it or not. Um, and it allows you to, you know, essentially, it's a repository for data. Question, how does it do for big data? Don't know, haven't done it. Yeah, <laughs> right. So uh, people have used Git for data for a long time. But the problem, of course, is Git restricts you, I think, to a 20 meg limit. And so anyone who's working with a 20 meg set of data is, you know, they need to go and get the real job or whatever, so yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> kidding. That's a joke, that's a terrible joke, so. I actually disagree with that statement, but yeah, so. Uh, so 
you know, all these new, para, new, new platforms, uh, new uh, projects out there are really trying to address that gap, which is how can you version your data? And not just data, ideally, you also want to version your model. And so DVC is one. I welcome you guys to take a look at that, right? Cookie cutter data science is something else that we have used in my previous career. It's also a way to version not just data in this case, but also version the code that you create the data, right? It's got some interesting you know, quirks, but it's another system that people have used. The one good thing about this cookie cutter is, let's say you have a team of data scientists that rotate around. It, has, it follows a very, very uh, systemic uh, pattern of how you put files, what, what kind of naming convention, so that if you go from one project to another, you know exactly what you're looking at. You know where to find the data, you know how to reproduce it, and, and that's a big benefit. So the other thing is like, if you're in multi-projects, trust me, you want something like this if you don't have it already because you will forget what you're doing, so. Any questions? Good, yeah, hopefully the, this is new. Who, who has seen Cookie Cutter here? Okay, a few, that's good. No, I th well, that's a good question. I think there's a recent vendor. I think they just someone had just, um, I would say, incorporated in their in their platform and supporting it. But um, you know, a lot of these are open source, and yes, that's a concern. So, but you, know, you need something. So, do I know any? I think there's a project in the making right back there. So, yeah. So, look. So, I hope you get that up, uh, you know, tomorrow. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions? No. Okay. Pachyderm is a fairly new system. It's also something that we are looking at uh, in my previous job. Uh, it's a very interesting system. Pachyderm actually allows you to um, version. It also goes by the the tagline Git for data with the other caveat that it has a lot of integrations. And some of the integrations are with something I'm gonna talk about next, but the ability to uh, run, and, and version and run and version your runs, both the data and the models, um, and be able to deploy them. So take a look at it if you have a chance. It's definitely worthwhile. And who's played with Pachyderm here, anybody? Um, next. Okay. One of the more interesting ones, which was put out by Databricks, is a system called MLflow. And so who's played with MLflow here? Okay, good, one, yeah. So MLflow is something definitely worth looking at. It, again, is supported by Databricks, so it's got fairly decent support. It's open source, so it doesn't, it's not tied to Databricks in any way. Um, it, again, allows you, it's got three components, and I've listed them here. It's got a tracking component, project component, and model component. And I'm not going to read the text, but you can see that the whole purpose of this is actually to address, you know, the model, data, lineage, uh, versioning, you know, tracking, you know, reproducibility. It's all there, right? MLflow is has one restriction, and that is is, is purely uh, it doesn't delve into deep learning. It sticks with just scikit-learn support. But since none of you guys have deployed deep learning, it's not an issue, right? So, <laughs> uh, any questions about MLflow? So real quick, just to show you the integrations that MLflow has adopted, you know, they, they're working with quite a bit of, with a lot, right? Now, they say Keras, and they say TensorFlow, but there's a caveat here. It, 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 you, can, you can version those models, but you can't deploy them. You can't run them easily. And therefore, I'm gonna talk about something else next. So, you can take a look here. So yeah, it's got R support. So forget about cookie cutter, just do this one, so. Okay, deployment, right. So let's talk briefly. You've trained a model, you know, it runs on your notebook, right? How do you get to run in production at scale? And so if you haven't hopped on the Docker bandwagon and the container bandwagon, I encourage all of you to spend that half hour and learn about it. So containers are a, not actually, they're not actually a new framework. It's a, it's a paradigm that's existed for a very long time. What essentially is lightweight VM containers. So VM, sorry, containers are lightweight VMs that they all allow you to run any type of OS on your machine, any type of uh, you know, dependency that you install, and then to snapshot it. So 
so that it will run exactly the same way no matter what machine, even on your Raspberry Pi, it will run exactly the same way. And this, uh, this ability to actually not just run containers, but snapshot and create images of those containers, which you can then deploy at scale, is what's making you know, the ability to scale and run deep learning production very easy. Like a lot of you maybe have, okay, so here's a good question. How many of you have used Spark? Right. How many of you like Spark? No, sorry. <laughs> no. So Spark, as you know, was invented to run analytics at scale, right? It's Scala-based, which is fun already, right? And to make matters worse, it's not so easy to run analytics I'm working at it, but just sizing your, uh, your nodes, your, it, it's, just not, it's just very difficult. It requires a significant amount of DevOps to do so, right? Containers, on the other hand, where we're headed, you know, pioneered by Google, so you probably know this, this is a very different paradigm. And we can talk about this next, and I'm gonna mention the K word, which was at the beginning, so. So again, what, does, what do containers do for you as the data scientist? They allow you to run your experiment, package it so it's reproducible. Whether your data is in that container or not, you can stick it all in there and make a giant container, which you don't want to do. But at least your dependencies are all locked in. And I can give you my container. You can actually run my exact experiment and get the exact same answer. Right? Not only that, if I have a model I really like, I package it up, and then I deploy that container, and something called an orchestrator can make multiple copies of it as much as you need in order to run the data through and run that through a giant cluster, which is how Google runs the, a lot of their analytics. Yeah, so who here is not familiar with Docker? I should have asked that. Okay, good, yeah, so I'm wasting time, so. Um, Docker orchestration. A number of tools have come out within the past few years that are really uh, starting to be embraced by industry. Uh, a lot of our clients previously are like, they're, they're really slow, they're still on MapReduce. And they've just started to look at the various uh, you know, containers and container orchestration in the in microservices. So obviously, you know, a lot of firm, people in, uh, a lot of firms in town are, are moving toward uh, OpenShift simply because of the, uh, the Red Hat affiliation. Um, obviously, Docker has been around, but Kubernetes is sort of, uh, and it's all different flavors, it's really gaining a lot of traction. And what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is an orchestration system for containers. Um, what's interesting about Kubernetes is this. Tremendous support throughout the various platforms, throughout the various uh, you know, tools out there. And when I say Kubernetes and cloud native, like that means a lot of different things to different people, but cloud or Kubernetes native means that it is a container native application. It doesn't mean take your existing software, stick it in a container and run it in the cloud. That is not what it means actually so, right? And when I say running uh, machine learning models in production, you know, in, a, in, a, uh, in the cloud through Kubernetes, such that you're not tied to an actual uh, cloud vendor, because you can do, actually run the exact same Kubernetes code, exact same instance, whether you're in AWS or you're Google or you're Azure, that's actually uh, what people actually are really trying to move toward right now, or at least aspirationally move toward. Some people have said, do I really need to be cloud uh, agnostic? And answer which way. Yeah, so how many people actually, again, just curious, how many people have deployed a model in Kubernetes? Oh, there you go, yeah. Good. So, so far we talked about, you know, um, we talked about ML flow, we talked about getting models, uh, really what I call traditional machine learning models uh, running at scale. How do you actually get a deep learning model to run at scale? And this is something that's uh, really on the cutting edge right now, is a package called Kubeflow. And what Kubeflow is, is the, it's a package that allows you to run deep learning models through Kubernetes orchestrated at scale. So if you think about it, and you do build that deep learning model, Think about Kubeflow. It actually integrates with MLflow. It integrates with Pachyderm, if you like. There's a lot of integrations. But the point is that you can actually run that model at scale now. You still might need 1,000 GPUs, but that's a different story, so. Who's playing with Kubeflow here? Yeah, so there's a whole host of interesting things. I'm gonna give another talk later this year about Kubeflow if you're interested. So 
it's a, I think one of the ways that we, it's a, it leads a bright future what we're doing in terms of uh, deep learning. Okay, any questions so far? All right, so my, coming to my last point, big idea, it's gonna be controversial, so. All right. This is not a plug for myself, so no, it's not. So the last thing is that there is so much information out there that whether you're a large firm or a small firm, leverage external resources, right? When I say external resources, consulting, uh, meetup resources, but it's just, you're not gonna be able to figure this out easily on your own because there's just so much out there. And whether you have a team of 10 or a team of 50, right, or a team like my old company that has a lot of people now, right, you still can't figure this out easily. And so do take advantage of some of the resources out there, whether, again, consulting contacts, um, you know, peer contacts, and because you don't want to repeat a lot of lessons that have occurred. And let's talk a little briefly about this. So. What does it take to actually deploy a model in production at scale, right? So we're not talking about a little bit of data, we're talking about enterprise-wide data running at scale, right? If you think about a model at Google, what does it take? It's not easy. The very first thing you should always focus on is data strategy, right? It's not good enough just to get that data and clean that data. Where are you gonna put that data? How are you gonna find it again? Is it like one and done, or are you gonna actually reuse it somehow? How do you search for data if you have enterprise-wide data? Like all these considerations of what you call data strategy, and they're actually extremely important, whether you're in a small organization or a large organization, right? The sooner you do this and address data strategy, the simpler your life will be and your analytic journey, right? Second, of course, is data science. We have a lot of data scientists out there. It's, uh, you know, everyone's paid really well. It's hard to get a data scientist. People are looking for a data scientist, right? Hiring data science talent is not easy. Uh, and in fact, even if you do hire data science talent, like we are not, you know, we are great at many things, but we're great at everything. And so that means that if you transition over to a new domain, it might take, there's a learning curve. And that learning curve is actually, you know, it's something that you have to consider. Like your project won't get off the ground right away. You have to make sure the person can actually gain the expertise in it. So, right? Uh, model training, again, we can all train models in notebooks, but how reproducible are they? And that's a really tough thing. Right? I mean, I, you and I, we could generate models in an hour, actually. But again, you ask me, what was the model file to produce it? And so that's why all these tools are out there. Adopt some of these tools, it's great. You just have to choose one, right? If you have a specific need, like, that's where you can actually ask for advice, right? Again, Slack groups, Nash Dev, the meetups, these are great places to actually ask questions and get good answers. Uh, now that you've trained a model, you say, this is a great model. We want to put this in production. It goes back to, again, it's really difficult to get that model in production. It really is. And to keep it in production, and to monitor it, and to make sure security's around it, right? Role-based access. I mean, there's just so much that you need to do. And, you know, short of hiring a team, and people do that, right? So a lot of people actually will reassign their DevOps team to do it. And the DevOps guys are like, no, I don't wanna do that. So it's, uh, it's not easy. Once you actually put it in production, to make sure the model is actually performing, it's performing to scale, it's performing as it should be, and the model drift is not there, you have to do that. Because the last thing you want to do is put a model there and just, you know, to say, I'm gonna live the consequences, whatever happens. So, uh, the last again is, you've got a model, you've got it running, you have to go back and review the business value of actually putting that model in production. Right, a lot of times we're trying to compete against some plain old Excel spreadsheets, so, right. So we have to justify that value. If we don't do that, we're not gonna get more resources to continue. Right, so the last thing is real quick, like, you know, AI is a service. So for large companies, you definitely can do this. You, can, you have the resources to actually address this. Maybe not the plan or roadmap, but maybe you do. You can address these. For small to mid-sized companies, however, you don't have the resources to do that, right? I consider myself now at a very small company and coming from a small company to a very small company, right? We didn't have the resources to do this. And what you're seeing now, and a lot of people, actually a lot of the vendors out there are actually moving towards this today, is a concept known as AI as a service or analytics as a service. But again, 
not just a service where I'm just going to run your analytics for you, but actually en encompass all those issues that we said before. Well, if you had a single platform to actually house the data that can actually you know, be your model dev environment and transition easily to your production environment and manage security, right? And what they're doing probably is they're taking advantage of a lot of the open source tools and building some integrations. And that's what we're seeing. And I expect us in the next year. So if I see you guys next year, hopefully, come back. So you will see a lot of this evolve toward this. And for even large companies and small companies, if you have questions, leverage consultants. Put there because they have knowledge, their experience, you know, they are consultants. That's what they're there for. And so uh, do not hesitate to do that. Now, I promise to have a little bit of a uh, fun analytic discussion here. So a little bit about last thoughts. So there's actually a shift that's happening in machine learning. And I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this. But and I gave a talk not too long ago about the fact that almost every problem that we face as data scientists is not a big data problem. It's a small data problem. Right? It's because we have lots and lots of data, but we have very little labeled data. And if you think about how humans learn, how do we learn? We don't learn by chugging through you know, 50,000 examples of what's a dog or what's a cat. Right? We learn by, here's the dog, here's a cat. Next time we see a dog, we know it's a dog. Next time we see a cat, we know it's a cat. And so it's, it's an instance where we're not looking so much at training data as examples of what we're looking for. And if you can think about where machine learning and you know, deep learning is evolving, it's toward the aspect where I don't need to give you, there's a positives, here's a negatives. And we say, this is a positive, this is a negative. Find me similar stuff. So it's a complete different paradigm about how to do that. Now, of course, it's not good enough to do that, just say, here's a positive, here's a negative. One sample, one sample, go and find it. You have to bring context in, which is why there's so much work right now being done in transfer learning, domain adaptation. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on in terms of uh, what we can do with you know, reinforcement learning, meta learning, all this crazy stuff my daughter's doing right now. So, yeah. um, you know, think about that. And the very last one is you know, there are companies and there are, there's an effort out there to automate some of the data science tasks. So I know that we talk about data science automating some of the other tasks. There's also, circling back, uh, an aspiration to automate some of the data science tasks. And just like everyone else down the line, we should look forward to that because no one wants to clean data, right? No one wants to actually sit there and wait for a model to run. No one wants to sit there and you know, uh, run grid tests or uh, grid search. So th think about that and see how, in fact, be aware that it's coming. And uh, if you do have a chance, look at some of the more interesting work that's being published right now about it. Yeah, so that's all I wanted to say today. And uh, I'm open to questions. Hopefully you guys gained something out of this. And uh, I'm bored to this here, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so questions, anybody? Yes. I'm sorry? Uh, as most people know, I'm in stealth mode, and uh, I've made a promise not to actually sell here, so I'm not, yeah, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, I will, we can address that another time. Um, other questions? Don't ask me how I came up with the name. Please don't sell. Yeah. <laughs> Do we all agree with this? Do we have any different opinions? Because that's how you actually build the discourse. So, No? Right, so to repeat the question, you said that a lot of data scientists are like people on Etsy. They want to build creative things, and yet to extract value, you need an Etsy, I guess. So, or just what, what's the layer that allows that? Um, I think that, you know, so one of the ways that in building a previous data science team, um, 
our senior folks were not just great at their craft, but it was very important for them to develop, uh, and not just the domain expertise, but it was important for them to develop the communication and the, the insight into product, into product market fit, into business value justification, and explaining how to, how to actually justify that value. So I think it's actually really important for people, uh, especially data scientists, as you proceed up the, the ladder, to say, you know, not just how can I you know, you know, get the best squeeze out the last percent out, it's also about how can I communicate this, and what is the actual business value? What am I working on? And get, dive a little deeper into that business side. Now, some people have said, maybe you can actually pair that data science up with um, you know, a product owner or something like that, or someone inside who actually understands the business side. I actually argue that every data scientist should and could actually learn that and probably should in the long run. So, kind of opinionated. Yes? Are there any differences do you see in the public sector specifically with education as opposed to just in business? Do you mean data science and education? Or I'm just going to ask a question. between um, data science and education and government versus uh, industry. Um, so having worked in both sides, I can probably make a, at least an educated uh, uh, remark about this. I think they're actually very similar. You still have a stakeholder. You still have a common goal that you're trying to achieve, right? Whether it's increasing shareholder value or preserving you know, taxpayer wealth, I think that it's important to actually look at both. And there are differences in terms of obviously appropriation and you know, just uh, budgeting cycles. But I think it's still the same in the sense that ultimately, you know, your goal has to be tied back into business. It can't just be, I have this pot of money I need to spend by, you know, December 31st. I'm going to look into some interesting problems. So I'm not sure if that really addresses your question, but you can hit me afterwards. So, yeah. Next. Yeah, so stuff is evolving at light speed. Uh, right now, Kubeflow is, is sort of the, where the effort is going on right now. Um, so I encourage you to look at that. Uh, but that's today. Who knows what happens in three months from now. So someone in the back might actually say, I'm going to do this, and there we go. So yeah, I think um, you know, in the end, it's hard to keep up with this. Right? You could probably imagine how much stuff is coming out there. And you didn't know about Kubeflow, and you only work in MLflow, you're just like, I'm not going to touch this. Right? If you didn't know about Pachyderm or DVC, you're going to say, okay, what am I going to do? Work the hard way. So uh, all of you guys hopefully are on social media or looking at just find some source for all this, whether it's social media, whether it's a news feed. Just stay, stay in the fire hose because you, it's hard to keep up, but you have to keep up actually right now. So. Or leverage consultants, like we said, because they are definitely not sleeping and keeping up. So, Any other questions? Okay, thank you guys very much.